This is the United States of America. Some say the land of opportunity, others say land of the free. Let's just say this country has had a pretty big say in global affairs in the last 100 years. My name is Anish and in this YouTube series, I'm going to cover the USA's entire 20th century. This is part one and it's going to cover US history from the turn of the century to the First World War. To give a bit of context, the USA ends the 19th century on a bit of a high. Between the Civil War and the turn of the century, the USA had rapidly industrialized and by 1900 it has the largest economy in the world. It also just defeated Spain in a short and decisive war in 1898 and marked the USA as not just an economic but also a military power. But at the same time, you wouldn't consider the USA as a truly global power. What it needed to be in this category was an empire. At this time, Europeans, but especially the British, the French and the Germans, well, they looked at the rest of the world and said, it's free real estate, and built up these massive colonial empires. With thinkers such as Alfred Thayer Mahan emphasizing naval expansion in American foreign policy, the USA built up their mini empire and went ahead and snatched up the Philippines, Puerto Rico and Hawaii during the Spanish-American War, and then built a big ass canal in Panama. But anyway, there is no more dramatic way to enter the 20th century than a president getting shot. The assassination of William McKinley in 1901 by an anarchist shook the nation. The man who took over the reins from McKinley was Theodore Roosevelt. He belonged to a movement in politics called the Progressives, and they believed that it was the government's responsibility to fix the problems in society. In the days of industrial capitalism, you can be damn sure of problems in society. At this time, you have large industrial monopolies called trusts, which held an insane amount of wealth and power in government, whilst ordinary working class people would probably earn just enough to feed their families. The government mainly served the interests of the businessmen and the wealthy, and there's a fear of a bit of resentment and class warfare occurring. Teddy Roosevelt decided to take matters into his own hands and challenge these monopolies in the square deal, with the three C's, conservation of natural resources, control of corporations, and consumer protection. Taking on big business earned Teddy Roosevelt the nickname of Trust Buster and made him immensely popular with the public. As the name suggests, the progressive presidents wanted to implement progressive reforms that will fix systematic inequality and improve society. But they also liked some not-so-progressive ideas, such as racial segregation and immigration laws. With nearly a third of its population foreign-born, America became a very multicultural nation, and you see massive communities of German, Irish, English and Italian Americans developing. And having this population with so many different ethnic backgrounds and interest groups is one of the main reasons why the USA decides to stay neutral for the first few years of World War I. Speaking of which, there's a storm brewing in Europe. When the First World War breaks out, the USA decides that this is just another European conflict and it isn't really their problem, so they decide to stay neutral. But America being America is like, I smell business opportunity, and uses this war as an opportunity to increase its trade with Europe. American businessmen and farmers actually did very well out of the war, but due to the Allied naval blockades, they only supplied the British and the French, and the Americans knew that the longer this went on for, the less likely Germany would be to tolerate them only supplying one side. Things took a turn for the worst, and the Germans started attacking Anglo-American trade in the Atlantic. In 1915, the unarmed passenger vessel, the Lusitania, went down, killing 128 American citizens. And this was a pretty big deal, and it was kind of like Titanic 2.0, Except this time, it wasn't an iceberg that stunk the ship. It was a German U-boat, and the American public were outraged. But Germany agreed that they wouldn't do this again, and so crisis averted. Woodrow Wilson ran for the 1916 presidential campaign under the slogan, He kept us out of war. And let's just say, this did not age well. In early 1917, Germany announced plans for unrestricted submarine warfare in the Atlantic, and kept destroying merchant ships, and more American citizens kept on dying. Then Germany sent the Zimmermann telegram to Mexico in early 1917, proposing an anti-American military alliance. And when the public found out about this, attitudes towards entering the war dramatically shifted, and Wilson finally decided that America must join the war. As to him, this wasn't just a normal war. It was a war for democracy. It would take over a year, though, for America to actually mobilize a decent-sized army in Europe. But when it did, they went hard. After the Russian Revolution at the end of 1917, Germany were free to shift their troops from the Eastern Front to the West and launched a major spring offensive in 1918. That failed, and when the already exhausted German army saw fresh American troops arriving to the front, this was completely demoralizing for them. By the summer of 1918, the sheer number of American troops gave the Allies a massive advantage and would launch an 100 days offensive and defeat Germany by November 1918. 
So now the task is rebuilding the world, and this was decided at Versailles. The British, but especially the French, wanted to severely punish the Germans for the huge human cost of the war. Wilson came into the conference as probably the most powerful man in the world at the time, and he had some points, about 14 of them. The bottom line was that Wilson wanted to see global arms limitations, reductions in trade barriers, and most importantly, countries being allowed national self-determination. The idea that a nation can be free to choose its own political identity without external interference, essentially saying cut back on the empires. The last point didn't exactly work out, and the British and the French massively expanded their African and Middle Eastern empires. Alongside this, Germany was told to pay massive reparations for the war, and they were told to take complete responsibility for it. The other side didn't exactly go how Wilson wanted it to, but Wilson also proposed to start another institution called the League of Nations, which was designed to prevent another global war from happening, and as we know today, they did an excellent job. But Congress actually voted against the USA from joining the League, with the belief that a global institution like this may interfere with American sovereignty. Despite the USA being the centre of global finance, industry and technology, Britain and France still maintain their global leadership roles after the First World War. That's all for this video. Part 2 will cover the interwar periods, the Great Depression and the Second World War. See you then.